This is Histories and Mysteries. I'm Ashley. I'm Jessica. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about the Spooky Crescent Hotel. Ooh. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I am going to be diving into a topic that I love. Um, it's all about mummies. Uh, and if any of you know me, you know I love ancient Egypt. And I don't think I've done an Egypt story since like our first or second episode when I covered Cleopatra. So yeah, yeah, I don't I'm think so either. Pumped. And yeah. stay tuned. We might have a special guest, Brendan Fraser. Here. Just kidding, we don't. But oh, I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> I would That'd be so to cool. To <laughs> oh my gosh I wish Brendan Fraser I wish he listened to this yeah I love him (laughs) can we just like start randomly tagging his like reps (laughs) listen to us we talk about you all the time Jessica's obsessed (laughs) I love him (laughs) he's a giant teddy bear (laughs) he does he's very sweet in the day Oh, he even today, man. He's like, so cute. He's so, so cute. Dope. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we do have some sad uh, history and mystery family news. Just yeah. to talk about it. Uh, yeah. And the only reason I'm talking about it is because I feel like it's not talked about enough. Um, and you all kind of feel like a family so I feel like I should probably share the news um I went to the hospital the other day and found out that I was having a miscarriage um the baby no longer had a heartbeat so that was really sad news and currently I'm kind of going through the process of medically aborting the baby because it's no longer living Mm -hmm. and I'm very grateful that I live in a country that I'm able to do that Yes, because like the stuff going on in the states right now is just unimaginable. Yeah, yeah. So it's I'm honestly doing better than I thought I would be. Yeah, but it's still rough. So I'm if my story isn't like as on par today, that's why. Yeah, how (laughs) far along were you? Uh, it was about I was supposed to be eight weeks. Okay, yeah, but. I'm not really sure when it stopped. I started experiencing pain on the Saturday and then I went in on, I went in Monday evening to the hospital thinking it was nothing and that I was being dramatic. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, the next day I had to go back for an ultrasound. And then like six hours later, the doctor told me about the baby. So so sorry. Yeah, we're just kind of going through the motions and yeah. you are so sweet, you and Cody, for sending me flowers all the way from West Virginia. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I love it. It was so sweet. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I think it was funny because I was actually researching for this story when they came. Uh-huh. So well, that's why like, I texted you and I was like, Are you working today? And you're like, No, why? And I was like, Oh, just curious. <laughs> oh, that oh, I did not even. I did not even put two and two together. <laughs> I just want to make sure you, and I told him if you weren't home, just to leave him at the door. But yeah. I was hoping you'd be there so they wouldn't like wilt in the heat. But yeah, no, Kyle got to them because I heard Milo barking, and I'm like, "What is going on?" <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was very sweet—a very nice, unexpected surprise. Oh, good. So thank you. You're welcome. And then shout out to my cousin; she just sent me a Starbucks gift card from for some like self care. Oh. So. Very sweet and works really understanding, which is amazing. So yeah, I have a really good support system and I appreciate all of you. So um, but yeah, I I know it's kind of a controversial topic, but I I feel like it's more common than we realize. Yeah. And and it shouldn't be controversial. yeah. Yeah. So I just I know it's a very personal subject to talk about, but I think it's an important one. So yeah, and you probably you know help someone out there feel less alone in the in going through that. I hope so. So if anybody needs to reach out, you can email me. (laughs) It's not a problem. I'm always around. (laughs) So yeah. Um, but yeah. Now that that uh, 
now that that's that yeah <laughs> and then to today us? she got a flat tire and her spare was flat so oh yeah are... that was fun and i had to have my tuck trode back home oh, God. and then my card got declined at the grocery store oh, <laughs> i was like oh my gosh so then i i took the remainder of my pills for uh the baby and then i had a nap <laughs> like <laughs> well deserved nap like a two hour nap. Good, good, good. So I'm very grateful that my dad is here because my husband had to go back to work. And uh, so I called my dad and he came to help out the last few days. And so he went and got Evie from daycare for me because I slept through the time I was supposed to go get her. <laughs> <laughs> so very grateful for the people I have around me. Um, my mom's been really supportive too. So and my family so good it's really nice yeah i have good people in my corner (laughs) good yeah but did you want to do do we want to switch gears here and you can tell me a spooky story yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) i was like like, i don't know how to transition this i don't either it's like (laughs) i'm just gonna go for it yeah that was perfect (laughs) perfect (laughs) All right. So as Jessica said, I did the Crescent Hotel. It is one of the most haunted hotels in America. Um, I'm not really sure why, but we'll oh. get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I would have thought like the Stanley hotel or. Yeah. And it's like, I, I guess I'm not really sure why it's so haunted. Like not a ton of like horrible things happened. Like I was expecting a much darker past, but yeah. Anyway, so I got my resources from Visit Muscatine, History of the Crescent Hotel, Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Historic Hotels of America. Awesome. All right. So all the way back in 1886, the Crescent Hotel was built. It was originally built as a resort for the rich and famous. Of course. And um, one article at the time said... With the opening of the grand, bleh, grand, <laughs> I know this word. Why can't I say it? What is it? Why can't I say this word? Grandiose. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I was like, I kept on getting stuck and I was like, I know this word. I'm okay. pretty sure I just said there you go instead of there you go. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Okay. Off to a good start. (laughs) Yes. With the opening of the grandiose Crescent Hotel, Eureka Springs entered a new and exciting era. Notables from afar are arriving in our fair city and soon many others will follow. The Crescent, built by Eureka Springs Improvement Company and the Frisco Railroad, is America's most luxurious resort hotel. Whoa. Featuring large, airy rooms comfortably furnished, the Crescent Hotel offers the visiting vacationer opulence unmatched in convenience and service. Ooh, I want to go. I know, right? And then it, <laughs> said, it goes on to say, tonight's gala ball will find in attendance many of the leaders in business and society. A guest of honor, the Honorable James G. Blaine, the Republican Ooh. presidential nominee, will attend with his charming wife, Laura, the very popular Harry Barton and his orchestra will play for tonight's festivities. Oh my gosh. They just like, I want that to come back. The, a gala? Yeah. Yeah. Same. same. Yeah. And just like all the clothes. Like, yeah. Ugh, yeah. None of those guys' pants under their butt. <laughs> Give me a man in a suit. Speaking of pants under their butt, I had to go to the vet today and this guy came in with his dog and he was like leaning on the, um, receptionist desk and like his yeah. whole butt was out i was like yes oh, like he didn't even have underwear like i saw his butt what <laughs> yes oh my goodness I'm like pull up your pants sir are anyway. the dogs okay <laughs> they seem to be okay no like is your dog okay why were you at the oh vet? yeah it was just her um finishing up her uh back her shots yeah. okay yeah okay okay and she got is her Lu- baby shot oh good is lieutenant better yes he, we paid that vet $350. Oh, I hate that. Just for them to tell us that he's perfectly fine. He's just, just an asshole. Being dramatic. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What a little dickhead. He's such a shit. That Ugh. happened with Tad as well. Like when he was, um, he was just like 
pooping, like not really pooping or doing anything. <laughs> and we brought him to the vet, spent like 500 bucks on him. And they were just like, yeah, he's perfectly fine. Yep. 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 Everything came back great. I was like, yep. Oh, just shit. being dramatic. Yep. 100%. <laughs> That's what happened to my mom's dog too. He's like this little, um, this little miniature shih tzu or whatever they're called. Like he stays <laughs> tiny. He's like eight yeah. pounds. He's so freaking cute. His name's Augie. And oh, I love that name. <laughs> he's so cute. Um, and he had his manhood snipped. Oh. And for like a couple of days, he like wasn't himself. And he like, I think he like wasn't eating or going outside or anything. Like he was just being a diva. And my mom was <laughs> so worried about him. And I'm like, he's probably just being he's super just... dramatic. Yeah. So she brought him to the vet. <clears throat> and they're like, oh yeah, he's fine. He's just being a drama queen. They're such assholes. They're such assholes. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> oh, but we love them. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Anyways, oh, back to the gala. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, so that was like the the news, like the opening, you know, article in the paper. So that's so cool. As you said, this hotel was a fancy. Uh, at the time, the cost to build this was two hundred ninety four thousand dollars. So that was back in eighteen eighty six. Adjusted crap. for inflation. Oh no. Nine point one million dollars. Holy crap! I need to look this thing up. It's beautiful. It's is it beautiful? Can we still go? Yeah, you can still go. Ashley, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. And it sat. The hotel sat on twenty seven acres, and it was kind of like in the mountains, so it overlooked this beautiful valley. Ooh, this is really pretty. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah. Even like back in the day when it was first built, it's gorgeous. Yeah, but I do have a fun story about this hotel before we get into the creepies. Okay, cats have always been a part of this hotel. Ooh, when it I first opened, there was a cat there that was considered part of the guests' gift of hospitality. And in 1973, an orange tabby walked into the lobby and never left, and he lived there for 21 years. And he Aww. was even called the general manager. <laughs> that's adorable and they said a local resident said um was interviewed and said the cat became the cat of not only the hotel but also the community mm-hmm. during those years no visit to the crescent would be complete without a morris that was cat's name sighting or better yet Aww. a chance to pet this hospitality icon I love that. <laughs> and since the Crescent was and continues to be the center for so much community activity, their cat became our cat. We yeah. loved it when we would see him enter and exit through his specially constructed kitty door. <laughs> the porta was flanked on both interior and exterior sides by carpeted steps to allow the ease of coming and going. Oh, I love that. And uh, furthermore, he, when Morris died, more than 300 people attended his farewell ceremony. Oh, isn't that so cute? I love that. And now visitors can step outside to see in the East Lawn area and see Morris's headstone, his photo, and a remembrance poem. Oh, isn't that cute? I love that. Yeah. Also, on a side note, it is not that expensive to go there. Oh, really? Yeah, it was like <clears throat> for five nights, it was $842 US. Oh, that's not bad for five nights. Yeah, for like one person, two out, like for one room with two adults. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Anyways, I love that about Morris. That's so cute. cute. <laughs> Ooh, I love I- it so much. And I wrote in here, we'll enjoy that because it stops being cute. So, oh no. <laughs> okay. So, part of the draw for this hotel was what they called the healing waters of the Ozarks. Now, this is, remember, this was back in the late 1800s. Mm-hmm. But once the healing waters kind of fell out of fashion, the hotel was less profitable and it fell into disrepair. In 1908, a group of inv- investors bought the Crescent Hotel, fixed it up, and remodeled it, remodeled it to be the Crescent College and Conservatory for Young Women. 
what that's weird it was definitely for wealthy families and uh the building and like the the land around it was so beautiful that they considered it like first class so like really rich ladies from around the country came to go to this like it was kind of like a college type thing uh however this is where her dark history starts Uh uh-oh Legend says <laughs> that one of the ladies of the college fell in love with a poor village boy and her father found out and told her she couldn't be in a relationship with him anymore because ew, poor people. And, ew, you ew. can't sit with us. <laughs> you don't even go here. <laughs> um, oh my God. Now she- I want to watch Mean Girls. <laughs> <laughs> she was devastated. And she decided to die by suicide. So she Aww. threw herself off one of the balconies of the building and passed away. Holy crap. This was quickly hushed by the school and ladies continued to enroll. And nothing ever really came of this, but the school itself was not making enough money for the investors. So eventually they closed it down. In 1937, this story is a doozy let me tell you what okay i'm excited <laughs> in 1937 a new owner named norman g baker bought the place so norman was born in 1882 and at the age of 16 he dropped out of school to be a machinist and he traveled from town to town doing his work and one night he saw what they called a mental suggestion show which is basically a magic show yeah he like the mentalist yeah he got hooked and he decided he wanted to do a show of his own so in 1904 he started a performance troupe um and his show was a hit it lasted for eight years he met his wife there but while they were on a break um he actually invented uh something called the air caliophone i think that's how you say it caliophone caliophone okay And it's basically an instrument. And before it was run by steam, but this was run by air, which was a lot cheaper. And it's like, have you ever seen those old timey, um, like, I don't know what to call them, kind of like a carriage. And it's got those like organ looking things in the back. Yeah. That's what it is. Oh. And this made him rich. Yeah. Yeah. So his next pet project was a radio station for Muscatine, Iowa. And this radio station gave him quite a reputation. He became very well known in the area. But it's, it's us. Well, instead of using his powers for good, <laughs> oh, no. he started to attack prominent men who he considered his enemy and he would spew baseless claims. So eventually people got pissed, called him out and turned against him. So somehow within all this, he heard about a man named Dr. Child Ozias, who had what he called a cancer sanitarium in Kansas City. Uh, So this piqued his interest and he got five people to go there for cancer treatment on his dime to see if it worked. And they came back with this cure. Of course. uh, From this place. And there he got the idea to make his own cure uh he would use a series of injections seven a day to be exact that would eat the cancer he said that surgery radium and x-ray didn't work and that this was the only cure okay (laughs) he published a magazine with his findings the only problem was that the patients were starting to die Uh, one died before he even published her his article called cancer is cured oh no Four of his five test patients died and he decided it was the perfect time to reprint his article and talked about the miraculous recover of his test patients. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. So his injections were glycerin, (gasps) carbolic acid, and alcohol mixed with watermelon seed tea, brown corn silk, and clover leaves. Yeah, that was his cure for cancer. So, and with that cure, he opened up the Baker Institute. Oh. In one year, this institute made him, in today's money, $4.8 million. Holy guacamole. Yeah. Well, the American Medical Association was like, oh, that's 
this is not good. Yeah. So they went after him. Um, and during this time, he ended up fleeing to Mexico, uh, but got bored. And so he came back and he was sentenced to one day in prison for practicing oh medicine without a license. Because as you heard his background, he has no medical background. Yeah. So his reputation was ruined in this area um, and his business had failed. So he decided to move to Eureka Springs where he bought the Crescent Hotel. He decided to open it as the new Baker Hospital where he started the same scheme until he was caught by the feds and thrown into prison. What a turd head. Like, why? Yeah. Needless to say, many people died in this hospital. Um, Maybe and then, that's why it's haunted, Ashley. Well, okay, yes. This was the only, like, I mean, other than, this was, like, the worst of it. And he was there for less than two years. I think they said about 20 months. And 40 people died in the hospital. That's so sad. That is really sad. But again, I just thought there would be, like, for it being the most haunted hotel in America, I just thought it would have, like, I don't know. A dark, like, some of those are were, like, old tuberculosis hospitals or, like, you know, um, mental hospitals stuff like that where they did horrible things and not saying that this isn't horrible this is horrible i yeah. thought it would be a bit of a darker history but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um i mean the hospital did have a morgue so you know he would take people there that died and in 2019 a ton of little specimen bottles were found buried behind the hotel and they do date back to Baker's time there. And they look to be tissue samples that he used in the pamphlets for the place. And so they're unsure if they're real, like from his dead patients that he like extracted tumors from, or if he bought them to go along with his scheme. Either way, super creepy. That's disgusting. Yeah. So after Baker's ownership, the hotel had been bought and sold a few more times and is now back up and running as a hotel. So that is the history. Let's talk ghosties now. Okay. So the Crescent Hotel, like I said, is known as one of the most haunted hotels in America. Ghost hunters, ghost adventures, and paranormal witnesses, which are all like TV shows, have all visited the hotel and they all found creepy ghosty things. So we're going to go. That would be super cool. But well, let me tell you about some of the things people see. I I don't know. One of them is we gotta go, uh, Ashley. <laughs> one of them is my nightmare. Oh, okay, little child. <laughs> no, no, no. So oh. Oh, no. <laughs> when the hotel was being built in the 1800s, one of the Irish stonemasons fell to his death um, off like where room what is now room 218 is. Okay. Apparently, this is the most active room. This is the part that I would just die. Witnesses have seen hands coming out of the bathroom mirror. You know how I feel about mirrors, Jessica. <laughs> oh my God, that's horrifying. I would just <laughs> fall back and drop dead. Oh my God, that's awful. Um, they hear the cries of a man falling and hitting the ceiling. The doors will open and slam shut. And there's been so much activity in this room that they've named the ghost Michael. <laughs> oh, that's not a creepy name. No. Um, in the crystal dining room, Ooh. people have seen playful Victorian ghosts. Uh, one Christmas, they had like packages, like probably fake presents under the tree. And they, the workers came in the next morning and all the packages were moved across the room and there were chairs circling the presents. Ew. Another time employees came in the next morning to find like menus scattered everywhere. Like everything was perfectly clean. And then there was like these menus just scattered everywhere. Imagine being the closing staff and then the opening staff come in. And they're like, what the hell? What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Closers didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> this was really creepy. Another employee saw two Victorian people standing facing each other like they were in a wedding, like they were getting married. Oh. The groom turned and looked <gasps> her in the eye and then they disappeared. Ah! She quit the next day. Yeah. <laughs> 
People have also seen a man sitting in a table by the window in the bar, and he will say to them, I saw the most beautiful woman here last night, and I'm waiting for her to return. People have also seen Victorian people dancing around the ballroom. So one of the ghosts um, dates back to, there's two stories behind this ghost. So they call it the ghost of Theodora. And they said she was a beautiful young lady who was a student of the conservatory and was said to be pregnant. She died as a result of a fall from the fourth floor balcony. Uh, Rumor has it that she jumped from the balcony, although some say she was pushed and people see her ghost in a lot of different areas. Um, And some present day visitors say that they have heard her screaming. Oh, I don't like that. Which that could be the original girl we talked about that fell in love with that boy. Yeah. But then there's also a story that um, Theodore was a Theodora was a cancer patient there, and she will introduce herself as such: say, "Hi, I'm Theodora. I'm a cancer patient." She will curtsy and then vanish. Oh. So there's two different Theodora stories. That's weird. Okay. Um, one guest who stayed there said for three nights in a row, he woke up tucked into the bed. Like he didn't go to bed tucked in and he woke up and he was tucked in the comforter. Don't like that. (laughs) Um, and then this is a, this is a creepy story. Like in here, it's a quote from the, from the, um, resource. And it says, this is about some guests that came in. So believing This person approached them and believing this person to be a hotel employee, they agreed to follow the man to their room. The man in a Victorian attire, which they just thought like, oh, this is part of the like, you know, little theme of the hotel, led them to room 221, unlocked the door and pushed it open. As the couple entered, the man stayed outside the door smiling and tilting his head from side to side. Ew, ew. One of the two realized that they had not tipped the man. And when they spun around with some cash, he had disappeared. Ew, I hate it. Perplexed, the two guests just relaxed in their guest room for the rest of the day. When they tried to re-enter room 221 later that evening, the door would not budge. The couple then went down to the front desk where they asked what was wrong with the key. The staff member stated that they somehow had received the room key to 321. And the the two described the man who had originally let them into room 221 and the staff member reported that no such person worked there. Ew, I hate it so much. There's also a reoccurring phenomenon that happens in this one spot on the third floor. Apparently this spot um, connects to like an annex built onto the hotel when it was a hospital. And this area is said to be a portal to the other side. lots of guests when they go in that area they become faint and some of them pass out um and at the same stop on the nightly ghost tour with no explanation wow these occurrences go in spurts many happening over several weeks or months and then there's like none for a really long time but when they do happen Um, the guests will like turn pale, they'll faint or fall against the wall. And the, when they do fall unconscious, it doesn't last like a really long time. Um, but it definitely is spooky. Yeah. Well, we have to go. And that's the story of the Crescent Hotel. I loved it. It's so creepy. But you know what I mean? For it being like, like I said, for it being the most haunted hotel in America, like it doesn't have a ton of crazy history. But it's so creepy. It is. And the oh, there's two things that I've never been able to get over from this podcast. Okay. Mirrors. Yeah. Which have always scared me, but this podcast made it worse. And the black eyed children. Those are heinous. I can't get over them. Ugh, I hate them. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't come for me. <laughs> oh, the black eyed kids are really creepy. Oh, my God. Those things keep me up at night still. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about something else that can be creepy. Mummies. Okay. <laughs> so, um, 
I got my sources since I keep forgetting to talk <laughs> about them. Um, <laughs> I got them from the Smithsonian history.com the conversation and all that's interesting of course <laughs> I had to throw my I had to of throw course. my my pals in there <laughs> okay so <clears throat> our stories like have something similar in them which is kind of funny Ooh. so we'll, we'll see if you can kind of we made a theme it. we always make themes without making themes <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's fun <laughs> all right so what is a mummy <laughs> It is a human or animal whose body has been preserved after death through drying or other means. When people think about mummies, they frequently picture the early Hollywood renditions of human forms covered in countless layers of bandages, their arms outstretched, and they're moving slowly. (laughs) Wow, this not... Wow. Wow. (laughs) It was almost like you froze. You're like... (laughs) <laughs> my brain froze <laughs> <clears throat> while this might not be the case in reality mummies do exist and they have a truly incredible story surrounding them the preservation of a body as a mummy has been a common practice for a very long time and it's happened all over the world i know people always think of mummies like coming from egypt but they're everywhere For thousands of years, mummification has been a method used by many civilizations, including the Inca, Australian Aboriginals, the Aztecs, Africans, and ancient Europeans. And they do this to honor and preserve the bodies of those that have passed away. It is believed that some tribes mummified every member of their population. Mummification practices vary by country, so like some only allowed this rite of passage for the well-off or privileged Mm -hmm. gotcha so even that has been around for hundreds of years (laughs) an easy approach to um, making a mummy was to expose a corpse to either the sun fire or extremely cold temperatures because most bacteria can't survive in those conditions Hmm. some mummies were also created accidentally oh So there was over a hundred mummies that were discovered in Mexico and these accidental mummies were interred in above ground crypts and these bodies weren't intentionally mummified, but the extreme heat of the region um, and the fact that there was like a lot of sulfur deposits in the soil and stuff, um, it suggested that that might have accelerated the mummification process. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. Which is really cool. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there's also Buddhist monks who engaged in the practice of self-mummification. And this one is creepy to me. Self? So they're alive still. Yeah. So... <laughs> They would basically starve themselves for extended periods of time, and they would only consume decay-promoting foods, whatever those are. They spent a few more years drinking a poisonous sap to induce vomiting in order to get rid of bodily fluids once their body fat was gone. The toxin also rendered the body an undesirable potential host for bugs that feed on the dead. When the time was finally right, the monks would be buried alive, where they awaited their death, followed by mummification. That sounds like the most horrific way to go. Right? Why? Why? Isn't that awful? And the really unfortunate part about all of this is that it actually rarely worked. Like the self-mummification rarely worked, but their death was really quickly, like came really quick once they... Once they were buried alive. Yay. So that's a positive. Did you figure out why they did that? Like what what was the purpose of it? I didn't dive like super into it. Um because I don't I don't I didn't wanna know. (laughs) I don't blame you. (laughs) It was something that I just didn't want to uh delve into. 
Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, the goal of mummification, regardless of the method used, was to preserve as much skin tissue as possible. So it just seems weird that they would do that. But yeah. The priests of ancient Egypt are regarded as the process's leading authorities. Sorry, I'm going to talk about the process of mummification through Egypt right now. Because okay. it's the most common, I find. Yeah. <clears throat> the arid atmosphere of Egypt made it simple to dry up and mummify a body, but the Egyptians regularly employed a more involved procedure to guarantee the deceased had safe travels to the afterlife. The process of mummification takes 70 days. Wow. Special priests handled and dressed the body. The priests required a thorough understanding of human anatomy in addition to knowing the proper rites and passages to be said at different times. All of the internal organs that might decay quickly were removed as the initial step in the procedure. The brain was extracted by delicately pulling out pieces of brain tissue with special hooked devices that were ups that were inserted up through the nose. Um it was a delicate procedure that might easily leave the face disfigured, and they Ooh. didn't want to do that because they want the body to be as intact as possible for going to the afterlife, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this also solidifies that because the abdominal and chest organs were then removed by the embalmers using a cut that was often performed on the left side of the abdomen. So it was only like a small slit in their side oh, wow. because okay. they didn't want to cause a lot of scarring and yeah stuff like that so really cool delicate process yeah they only left the heart in place because they thought it represented the core of a person's intelligence and existence the stomach liver lungs and intestines were preserved separately and they were put in special containers known as do you know I did at one point, but I don't anymore. <laughs> okay. Canopic jars. Oh, no, that's not what I was going to say. So no, oh. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> These canopic jars were then uh, buried along with the mummy. The organs were then treated, wrapped, and returned inside the body in later mummies. And canopic jars that weren't used during this process, so like they just put the body, like the organs back in the mummy, they were still used in the burial process. So they were still part of the, the ritual. Gotcha. The body's moisture was then completely removed by the embalmers. In order to accomplish this, they covered the body with natron, which was a salt that had excellent drying properties. And then they stuffed extra natron packets inside of the corpse. Embalmers removed the inside packets and gently rinsed the natron off the body once the body had completely dried out. A very dried out but recognizably human figure was the end product. Sunken portions of the corpse were filled in with linen and other materials, and the artificial eyes were placed to make the mummy appear even more lifelike. Then the wrapping started. Several hundred yards of linen were required for each mummy. Long strips of linen were painstakingly twisted around the body by the priests, who occasionally wrapped each finger and toe individually before encircling the entire hand or foot. Amulets were interspersed within the wrappings, and some of the linen strips had prayers and mystical writings on them to protect the dead from misfortune. Between the layers of linen, the priests frequently inserted a mask of the person's face. The form was covered with warm resin at various points, and wrapping resumed. The priests finally placed the last shroud in place and fastened it with linen strips. The mummy had finally been finished. There were other people working during this time besides the priests. And um, so it was basically the people in charge of making the tomb and preparing it for this person's passing. passing. Um, And obviously, like, these tombs and stuff were being worked on for a long, long time. Yeah. um, Well, before the person was expected to pass, but then kind of things had to move more quickly once the person finally did pass yeah and the tomb needed like a lot of items that a person would require in the afterlife so wall murals of religious or everyday subjects were painted furniture and statuettes were set up and meal or prayer lists were completed 
When necessary, in the afterlife, these models, images, and lists would magically transform into the real thing. So once all of that was completed, the funeral could now begin. Priests conducted elaborate religious procedures at the tomb's entrance as part of the funeral. The opening of the mouth was the most significant portion of the event. With the aid of a special tool, a priest touched various portions of the mummies to open them to the senses that would be useful in the afterlife. An example would be if the priest touched the item to the mummy's mouth, that mummy could now speak and eat in the afterlife. Oh, okay. Which is really cool. He was now prepared to make this trip to the afterlife. So once all of that was done, the entrance was sealed and yeah. The entrance was sealed. <laughs> <laughs> and then people in the future find these sealed entrances and open them up and make a curse upon us all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, it's actually really fascinating too, because some of these pharaohs were buried with their pets and their servants. I've heard about the servants and like wives too. Isn't that awful? Pets. Yeah. But they need those in the afterlife. So. <laughs> These intricate burial customs would indicate that the Egyptians were fascinated with death-related ideas. However, because of their intense love of life, they started making preparations for their death early on. The present was the best life they could imagine, and they wished to ensure that it would endure after death. All classes of ancient Egyptians performed mummification. However, the procedure wasn't as complex for the poor. Salima Ikram, an Egyptologist, claims that some corpses were only filled with juniper oil to disintegrate organs prior to burial. Between the 12th and 17th centuries, medical treatments prepared from powdered mummies were popular, according to a 1927 abstract that appeared in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine. Numerous mummies were disentombed and cremated during that time to provide this demand for mummy medicine. Ooh, mummy medicine. The alleged therapeutic qualities of bitumen, a form of asphalt from the Dead Sea, were the basis for interest in using mummies as medicine. Although, from what we know, that wasn't typically the case as they were typically embalmed with resin. So, they were just mowing down mummies for no reason oh. people have consumed fallacy seen stuff. <laughs> what mowing down mummies oh. <laughs> mummia which was a medicine made from mummified bodies that was sold in apothecary shops and consumed for generations by both the rich and the poor was made from the remains of mummies that were brought back to europe from egyptian tombs oh Apothecaries were using ground-up mummies for their otherworldly medicinal properties by the 12th century. And for the next 500 years, mummies were prescribed as a medicine. Not everyone was persuaded, though. Guy de la Fontaine, who was a royal doctor, questioned mummies' usefulness after witnessing forged mummies made from dead peasants in Alexandria in 1564. He, mummies. Ew. Yeah. He realized that people could be duped and they weren't always eating real ancient mummies. I think that's a good thing that they're not eating, but then they're eating other humans. So never mind. It's all bad. It's all bad, Jessica. But like, it's funny the similarities between our stories. Oh, like the, the, the con artist. The con. Yeah. 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 I was like, eating humans? That wasn't in my story. (laughs) (laughs) However, the forgeries highlight an important point. There is a constant demand for dead flesh to be used in medicine. And the supply of genuine Egyptian mummies was insufficient to meet this demand. Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder how many mummies, like, they went through, like, how many more mummies there were before this. They went through those. I had this book growing up and it was about Egypt and stuff. And there's a picture in it. And it was also on in one of the articles I read. And it was of this uh, street vendor in Egypt. And he had just like mummies lined up against a wall for people to come and purchase. Oh. 
But remember, it wasn't just like pharaohs that were mummified, right? It was the peasants as well. So I hate all of that. Yeah, sorry. Not the mummying part, the yeah part. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, and all of this was still going on by the 18th century. Really? That late? Yep. Wow. Some doctors believed that fresh meat and blood were more alive than the long dead. Even the most noble of nobles were persuaded by the claim that fresh was best. After suffering a seizure, England's King Charles II took medication made from human skulls. And until 1909, physicians routinely used human skulls to treat neurological conditions. Uh. Eating mummies seemed like a royally appropriate medicine to the royal and social elite, as doctors claimed mummia was made from pharaohs. Royalty dined on royalty. That's awful. (laughs) People were no longer consuming mummies to cure illnesses by the 19th century. But Victorians were hosting unwrapping parties where Egyptian corpses were unwrapped for entertainment at private parties. What? Yep. Even the pretense of medical research was soon lost. Mummies were no longer useful, but rather exciting. A dinner host who could entertain an audience while unwrapping a mummy was wealthy enough to own one. Oh, my. As the 20th century began, mummy unwrapping parties came to an end. The Good. macabre. I hope the they macabre. were all haunted by those mummies. Right? <laughs> the macabre thrills appear to be in poor taste, and the inevitable destruction of archaeological remains appear to be regrettable. Yeah, you think? And the black market for antiquity smuggling, including mummies, is now worth around $3 billion. So let's talk about some famous mummies. Okay. Okay. So well, first we have obviously King Tut. That was my first one I was going to say. Yeah. (laughs) And he's arguably the most well-known mummy in recent history. British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered his tomb and mummified body in 1922. Although it was an exciting discovery, multiple mysterious deaths were destined to overshadow it. Folklore holds that disturbing a mummy's grave results in death. However, Carter was unfazed by this belief and continued to open Tut's tomb. And here we are in 2022. (laughs) Thanks, Howard (laughs) Carter. (laughs) Even though the alleged curse spared Carter's life, the story was sensationalized by the media when numerous expedition members passed away too soon from strange reasons. Oh. Next up, we have the Toland Man. This natural mummy was discovered in a Danish peat bog 65 years ago. Oh, wow. These kinds of discoveries, known as bog bodies, are not uncommon. Bog bodies? Yeah. Ew. I want to be a bog body when I die. The remains are well preserved in the bog, but the Toland man stands out. He was so well preserved, in fact, that authorities initially mistook him for a recent murder victim. Oh, wow. It wasn't until later that it was discovered that they were 2,300 years off. (laughs) That's a lot of years. Yeah. Next up, we have Otzi, and he's the most well-known mummy in the world. He is not Egyptian, and he is also not wrapped in linen, which is another common misconception about mummies. He is, however... A 5,000-year-old man who was killed and left in the ice 53 centuries ago. Wow. He was soon encased in a glacier where he remained for millennia before being discovered in remarkably good condition in 1991. Otzi is now the oldest European natural mummy, proving that nature can sometimes do a better job of keeping us fresh than we can. (laughs) For a time, he was also at the center of one of the world's oldest murder investigations. <laughs> Initially, it was assumed that he had died from exposure to the elements, but it was later determined that he was most likely murdered by another person. Oh. So that's kind of cool. I thought you meant because they had first mistaken him as something no. else. I thought you meant that. Case. Oh. But I got gotcha. you. No. Okay. Yeah. 
And then finally, we have a mummy who is a female. And rarely would like beautiful come up when you're describing a mummy. <laughs> but you'd understand why Ziohi earned her moniker after seeing her preserved body. Oh, I'm gonna Google it. Okay, I'll tell you how, how to do spell, you spell her. Name. It, yeah. X I A O H E. I mean, the reason she's beautiful (laughs) is because her facial features have remained mostly intact, despite the fact that she's been dead for nearly 4,000 years. And that includes her skin, hair, and even her eyelashes. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely see that. And they have like a, a, like a rendering of her next to her mommy. She was beautiful. Yeah. Like her, like in comparison to the Egyptian mummies, like her mummy is very well preserved gotcha okay i get that then yeah she is one of the tarim mummies so named after their discovery in the tarim basin of modern day xinjiang china as it turned out the natural conditions in this area were ideal for body preservation oh and that's my story on mummies oh i i loved and hated it because now i know how common eating mummies was and that was something that i don't think i ever needed to know but makes sense (laughs) makes sense you know (laughs) um but on to like other things i have a joke oh i have one too but go ahead okay so do trees poop no where do you think we get number two pencils from then? <laughs> All right. This is a good one, too. I liked this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> looking at my face is like reading in the car. It's all right for 10 minutes. Then you start to feel sick. <laughs> oh, no. I really like that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh okay well if you want more of us lovely ladies you can find us on facebook and instagram and if you'd like to rate and review us we would really appreciate it because it helps us get out there we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week bye, bye.